Gabriel Diefenbach, Common Mystic Prayer, Chapter 4, On the Use of a Term. It may be surmised that if there is any distrust of mysticism, it's due to the misconception of its real nature. Some who have written on the subject have written from personal experience. Others have written after prolonged study, without perhaps the direct experience. This may account for the opposing judgments, the varying discernments and enthusiasms found among spiritual authors. One excellent ascetical treatise, for instance, would convey the impression that mystical or contemplative prayer is not linked with the normal course of the supernatural life, bears no direct relation to it, but is wholly extraordinary and eccentric. Such a view has wrought damage by fostering mistaken notions and evoke an adverse prejudice. Happily, the idea is now tending to correct itself. A Catholic philosopher deplores the fact that mysticism should still be so widely regarded with suspicion, even by Catholic writers, as something abnormal, something with which the healthy religion of normal folk has no concern or at best, it is considered an extraordinary favor, granted like miracle working to a few chosen souls, with which the ordinary Catholic has nothing to do, yet mysticism is the very lifeblood of sanctity. Mysticism, the same writer goes on to say, is not an accident of religion or something extrinsic to it, but belongs to the supernatural life of sanctifying grace and is organically connected with it. This in no way conflicts with the fact that mystic prayer is not attainable solely by one's own effort, but remains in the end a gift from God. A new impulse of grace comes in, changing the soul's mode of communication with God and affecting a purer, more spiritual relationship with Him. It is a blossoming of the Christian supernatural life in this world as the beatific vision is its full flowering in the next. In view of these remarks, it is not only desirable but necessary to attach an exact signification to the term mysticism. The connotations of this word as so carelessly bandied about in daily life are various and vague. In the popular imagination, it covers a multitude of oddities. Some identify it with an impractical idealism, labeling one guilty of such idealism a mystic dreamer. Others associate it mainly with any brand of occultism imported from the East. Often it is used as suggesting mere mental mistiness and confusion of thought. Or again it is exploited in literary criticism when, for instance, certain poets are called nature mystics, as seeming to possess a power of intuition in penetrating nature's veil to the hidden meaning of her phenomena. In the present treatise, the term is employed in its most limited, its theological sense, as referring to a very definite religious experience. Specifically, mysticism is here identified with contemplative prayer, This prayer is due to the action of grace upon the soul, causing the mind to know God in a different manner and the heart to love Him with an exceptional energy. Hence, mysticism may be defined as an infused loving knowledge of God. God imparts it to the soul without the use of word, reflection, or imagination. So, if it be asked how the mystical life manifests itself, the answer is, It manifests itself in prayer. If a person uses such contemplative prayer, he is in possession of the mystical life. He prays mystically and may be called a mystic even though he has never had a vision or a revelation. This applies not only to persons who have enjoyed the prayer of union or ecstasy, but with equal truth to those experiencing the common and almost imperceptible beginnings of mystic prayer. Obviously, we exclude contemplation as understood by St. Ignatius in the spiritual exercises, which apparently is a simplified type of meditation. 
In it the mind and imagination work in the usual way, and the prayer is therefore within the scope of personal effort. Likewise, we drop the distinction acquired contemplation, whatever it may be, and refer only to that contemplation which St. Francis de Sales, St. John of the Cross, and other masters of the spiritual life rank as the prayer immediately following upon meditation. It is not vocal prayer nor meditation wherein thinking and feeling constitute the main activity. It is rather a heart-to-heart communing between the soul and its spouse in prayer of a purely spiritual nature. Reflections and emotions are not the staple of it. The soul desires not thoughts about God but union with Him and maintains itself in peace and calm as enjoying a loving communication with Him. It is the Holy Spirit praying in the soul and the soul concurs in loving consent. One whom God is Drawing to this grace has the beginnings of mystic prayer, otherwise known as the prayer of simplicity, of simple regard, infused prayer, the prayer of faith, interior prayer, spiritual prayer, contemplation. These expressions refer to one and the same experience under different aspects. Thus, we identify mysticism with contemplation in which, through a fresh stirring of grace, God makes himself possessed more directly by the soul in a kind of intuition, though generally barely perceptible of his presence. As this manner of communing with God differs so strangely from that to which the soul has been accustomed, it may be said to be secret. This accords well with the first meaning of mystical, something obscure or hidden and it is most happily called secret, since the nature of this communication from its very spiritualness can neither be adequately described nor even distinctly understood. There are no images or concepts properly to express it. Thus it remains secret even to the soul itself. For a better understanding of this, nothing could be so helpful as a discussion of the powers of the soul in order to observe how they function in both knowledge and prayer. Chapter 5. The Soul and Its Powers A general definition of prayer frequently given is the converse of the soul with God. This is a broad and fair definition. But when a basis for distinguishing the various kinds of prayer is required, it must be sought in the nature of that very converse. The communion between the intelligent creature and its creator, must be held either in accordance with the soul's natural powers, something which they can effect unaided, or after some manner operated by God himself in the soul. In the one case, the soul's own activities, supernaturalized by grace, predominate. In the other, they are more passive, as attentive to the action of another. With such a distinction in mind, all prayer is reducible to one or the other of two general categories, meditation or contemplation. Meditation will embrace every manner of prayer which the soul can achieve of itself, whether vocal or mental. Prayer, which requires a further action of divine grace, will fall under contemplation. The soul is a spirit, and therefore simple and indivisible in itself, but it operates through certain faculties or powers, some of which are higher and some lower. The higher powers are the intellect and will, which exercise the functions of knowing, determining, and loving. In these two powers, the soul exhibits a resemblance to angelic spirits and to God. Man, however, as a partly material being, has also lower faculties subordinated to the higher and spiritual. These lower powers correspond more directly to his sense nature. Under the intellect is the imaginative faculty. Herein are handled the images, forms, and figures which have been obtained through the sense perceptions of seeing, hearing, tasting, and the like. Under the will are the faculties of the sensual appetites, 
together with the feelings and emotions. Now it is only by means of these sense faculties that the soul can attain to an intellectual knowledge of external things. When the eye beholds an object, an image of that object is obtained in the imagination. This in turn is worked over by the intellect, which strips it of accidentals such as color, size, shape, to arrive at its essence, finally, as spiritualized in an idea or concept. The intellect further uses these ideas and concepts in its reflections, and so advances from knowledge to knowledge. The will, as the highest appetitive faculty, follows the intellect, adhering to what appears good, rejecting what seems bad. This is the usual process of all our knowing and willing. If the exterior senses, such as sight and touch and smell, were completely cut off, the soul would be as a blank, devoid of images and ideas of external things, and of all knowledge save that of its own self-consciousness. Thus all our knowledge comes ultimately through channels of sense. In a similar fashion, all our converse with others, except God with whom we communicate by merely thinking or willing, our reception or communication of knowledge and love must be made by the lower sense faculties, as through speaking, looking, and motioning. Beyond this mode of knowing and communicating, the soul in its present state has no power of itself to reach. And this is the manner employed by the soul in all prayer before contemplation. It must speak to God in terms derived from sense perception. It must use images and concepts to arouse holy affections of love. But in contemplation, God himself intervenes to engage the soul in a spiritual converse free from sense-bound activity. He begins to silence these sense labors and gives the soul to taste of a more simple operation without the aid of image, concept, or reflection. This will be a prayer of simplicity, interior, mystical, free of all discursiveness. End of chapter 5